Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California. You are listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hey, 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 everybody. This is Ali Alanius, your host. I am so happy to be launching season four with you today. As always, I am just like everyone else, living day to day. And being in media is a unique, uh, it's a unique thing right now because it's an opportunity to bring goodness, empower others, and just, you know, do what we do. So, um, you know, a little update because I know we've been on a little bit of a hiatus for me. Uh, My husband, For those of you who know his film that was shut down during COVID, it finally got to get finished. I can now share that the movie The Card Counter is done and sold. It stars Tiffany Haddish, Oscar Isaac, Willem Dafoe, Ty Sheridan, which my husband worked on with Night Clerk with her, which is is kind of popular right now on Netflix. And uh, just really good to finally have a project on to the next, of course. And, And then so I continue with the podcast. I started writing my next book. I've and that's really fun and creative, but um, but uh, so I'm excited to be back, and I have a really amazing guest today for you all. And but before I do that, I'm gonna t- say something. I'm not throwing away my shot. Okay, I am like so many others uh, on my little hiatus. I finally got my shot to see Hamilton. Thank you, Disney Plus, for making me actually officially part of the cool club now. Because not only for me, look, and I know that some people, I I was telling one of my friends, and they're like, I was bored by it. Okay, but for me, maybe it's the music and and everything about it. Maybe it's also the age demographic. Lin-Manuel, he's another, you know, he's 40-something. I'm this creative. I'm in that 40-something. And just being change maker is something I admire. I not only admire, I aspire to do within my own life and what we're doing here and in, in with Unsugarcoated Media and whatnot. So, man, this in this film, no matter what, it gave me um, kind of this renewed sense as far as being an American. I cannot lie, even though I know characters were changed and all this, to be honest, to just really see some more background about the men and me loving history so much, uh, seeing the men that did actually fight for what we now appreciate as America was uh, was really cool. Flawed individuals. Um, I'm actually not surprised by this, by the way. But I mean, in a days in today's world where we do have the luxury of having social media and so much at our fingertips to really, truly create um, a movement it's I cannot imagine what it was like when back in the day all you had was your dreams, your voice and a soapbox and your pen and paper, which is Alexander Hamilton did. I mean, and that's and, and to create a movement that ultimately birthed a nation. That's incredible. That's incredible when you did not when you couldn't tweet about it. Right. And so with that, OK, segueing today, guys, I actually want to have a conversation about, you know, kind of the what's happened since that birth came out and what are we what are we looking at today and the and the lives that we today we live with the legacy of who we are as Americans right every day that we contribute to this country whether you were born here or not you do not have to actually have been born here to be an American but to love this country for all that it is it's good and it's bad I have invited an incredible guest um And let's get started. You guys are about to see him in a minute. A sixth great grandson of President Thomas Jefferson, one of the 56 original signers of the Declaration of Independence, author, global news anchor, and TV personality, Shannon Lanier gained national attention for his part of the project titled The Descendants, in which a London-based photographer, Drew Gardner, recreated portraits of some of history's most famous figures by photographing their direct descendants. Shannon is also the co-author of the Random House Inc. book, Jefferson's Children, The Story of One American Family, along with photojournalist Jane Feldman. The, The book follows his journey to uncover his heritage as a direct descendant of President Thomas Jefferson and his slave, Sally Hemings. And so today, ladies and gentlemen, we are so honored to have him here um, to share what that means and his experience. And everybody, please welcome Mr. Shannon Lanier. Hi there. How are you? Hey, thank you. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. So you're talking to us today from Houston, yes? Yes, and it's very hot here, but I'm in Houston. 
<laughs> well, you know, I mean, first of all, I was intrigued when I did my research on you. OK, um, because and fu oh, and funny enough, speaking about Hamilton, have, which have you seen? Oh, I've seen it live on Broadway as well as on Disney Plus, And it is amazing still. I think I like Disney Plus just a little bit better because you really get to see the expressions on their faces up close. But uh, other than that. I know we're having a little oh. technical difficulty right now. Um, let me try to see if I can go to another location. I know how it is. And thank you, because that's the one thing since COVID took on. I, I normally did it in the studio. And like so many, we're we're dealing with the challenges. And I know Wi-Fi can sometimes make it <laughs> a little bit yeah, of a challenge. I go through the same thing in my house. <laughs> which, <laughs> okay, is why well, this is which is why when I do my end, I'm like, I'm in the studio. Because <laughs> I know. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Smart. So, so, okay. So yeah. So you, so I, and I agree with you by the way, that I love being able to see the expressions, the passion, the music, the modernization of it. I personally loved. Yeah, definitely. You really get a sense of being there with them and moving around the stage and just the cinematography was pretty impressive. And of course the music, I'm addicted to the soundtrack. So <laughs> man, it's on repeat. Like, I feel like every time I'm going to do a podcast, I need to listen to like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not giving away my shot. Like I, I am, I am my house, my husband. Oh, and then the thing is, so Lin-Manuel in general is like a genius and no Moana. I didn't realize he did all the songs for Moana. And my daughter just hit that age and Disney plus was like Moana. And I'm like, <gasps> That's, I mean, I'm, so in general, I'm a fan of his style, his production, his whole his whole thing. Um, how was it for you as a descendant of Thomas Jefferson to watch this particular uh, play? It was intriguing, and especially, you know, they threw out a line to Sally Hemings mentioning Sally in the play, so that was cute. I said, Lin-Manuel should have to come on as a guest appearance and play Jefferson and the play and, you know, rap a little bit. Look, I know the soundtrack, so we can make it, we can make it happen. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's funny. We're actually, uh, because through our nonprofit, we want to get Lin-Manuel on, on Unsugarcoated Podcast because we love what he has to say. And and being a person, what I, um, what I was intrigued was the way when he said he wrote that song, uh, My, The Eyes Are On You, you know, uh, eyes are on you. The eyes are on you. And we do have, I feel like as a creative myself, when I wrote the last book that I did, which takes on stereotypes of racism and things like that. And it, and my, pat, my, what my, my inspiration was helping people see a different perspective and to realize that we are all responsible to each other. So anyways, I say that to say like for you watching it, um, I think it must be, did you know, did you know that um, Prince Harry, Prince William, they are sixth great grandchildren to King George, which wow. was in the play. And it was funny because when I heard that fact, I was like, well, it makes sense. Because now knowing that you're the sixth great grandson, I was like, well, it would make sense that they are the sixth great grandchildren to King George. Because uh, when, when, you know, and then also something that I was, was just recently aware was that Alexander Hamilton may have had there. It is rumored that he had a biracial son with a black woman before he married uh, Eliza and that he, there is a William Hamilton that was his son and who was an abolitionist. And so the reason why I bring that up is because I want to ask when you so it seems like you didn't know that you have had this opportunity to explore who you are. Right. And it goes very deep. It, does it? Do you feel fortunate in that, or do you feel that there might have be a little bliss to the people who don't get to say, "Well, Alexander Hamilton is also my forefather"? You know. Well, I think I feel lucky in the sense that a lot of people still don't know their lineage and where they come from, who their forefathers were, and their family. So, you know, I'm still searching for more on my father's side to find out more about that. But I mean, I am fortunate because I do know who I descend from, regardless of. It being Jefferson, you know, I'm just as proud as of my ancestors that were enslaved people because they survived the unthinkable and so the, the strength and the courage that they had to survive the those treacherous, you know, journeys and mistreatment and things that they had to go through as enslaved people. You know, 
I come from, the strongest of the strong. So I, you know, admire them for being able to survive as well. And the fact that I know who I am today is a testament to Sally Hemings and all those who kept the, the, the oral history and the family alive. Because, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, weren't able to document or talk about who they descend from. Right. Right. I mean, that's a big deal for a lot of people. So I, I shared with you, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of multiculturalism. And I think you and I are both people, I, I have a long lineage in America. On my, mother, on my father's side, I'm immigrant, like fresh off the boat. I'm a first generation. But on my mother's side, ironically enough, it's rumored that one of our descendants got land in Virginia from Thomas Jefferson. And so wow. I... I have this lineage here, and they fought on the Confederate side of the Civil War, right? But yet when someone looks at me, and I've mentioned this before, they see brown hair, brown eyes. They, I've been accused of being anything except white. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. and so I, when, I, when I promote that, I, I wonder, because I've also seen people have this sense like, if you started with a white family lineage, if, if it, it somehow makes it negative, if it Go, moves into a side which is not white if it is black or diverse that diversity scares some people when you yeah i think it makes you more of a rich and involved a whole person it gives you you know more appreciation for different cultures you get to embrace more people more cultures more food all these things so i just think that makes you a, a better person a greater person to have all this diversity i mean that's what our country is founded on this mixing pot that we have become now and this world is really, I mean, we, if you believe in Adam and Eve, we all came from Adam and Eve in the first place. So exactly. we've just now become a little bit more diverse and I embrace that. And if you go to any, pretty much any uh, black reunion, you're going to see the, the spectrum of the rainbow there. People in my family have blonde hair and blue eyes to, you know, very dark black skin. So you get everything if you go to a uh, family reunion, but that's just what, this country has become, and it's a beautiful thing to embrace. It's very interesting when you say this, Shannon, because it brings me to a memory where when I was a kid, um, my, my biological mother married a man who his stepfather was black. And so my mother, my family, I, I'm not going to lie, and I talk about this very honestly, not trying to paint my family as bad people, but they had ideas that, you know, that were racist. <laughs> they were just racist thoughts. And... In her mind, she because my stepfather wasn't biologically black, he was okay. But I remember very distinctly one time her going to a family reunion, which, as you mentioned, and that's why I'm sharing the story, because I was disheartened when she said to me, I remember her looking, she, she brought back a picture, and she said, look at this picture and see how it was white, and then she went and married a black man, and now there's a section here that's black. And I thought, and I mean, I know this is horrible because people will say that was your mother. And I'm like, but it doesn't matter. I knew even as a child what she said was wrong. I thought it was a very disheartening thing. And I didn't like it. It made me feel uncomfortable that she viewed people in that way. So you were part of this incredible project. And I know we have, you know, you you uh, did the book Jefferson's Children, right? So tell us. So I'm sharing this experience. I'm hoping you had something obviously totally opposite as you went on this journey and reconnected with this you know, what was that like? Well, my co-author, Jane Feldman, and I traveled all over the country interviewing four generations of descendants, both through Thomas Jefferson's wife, Martha's side of the family, and through his slave, Sally Hemings' side of the family. We really wanted to sit down and get intimate and in-depth interviews with these people of what it was like for them to be a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. Some of them were just finding out after being raised their entire life that they were white, finding out that they actually descend to Sally Hemings' side of the family and that they have black blood in them. And some of them embraced it, some didn't. We right. interviewed a guy, Dan Hemings, who was raised as a racist. Like a majority of the people in his family had Confederate flags tattooed onto his body. But after marrying his wife, Mary, she taught him and encouraged him to not raise their children that way. And he broke that cycle of racism in his family and said, you know, I'm not going to raise my children to think this way and believe these things. And I think he just teaches us the lesson that no child is born a racist and it's something that has to be taught. But as in Dan's case, it's something that can be untaught as well. And I think in your case, it's something that can be untaught because you didn't live the same mindsets that your mother had and you 
don't have to. And I think that's one of the lessons we teach and we go around and teach and uh, speak at different schools is we encourage kids that just because your parents may think a certain way doesn't mean you have to, doesn't mean you have to perpetuate those mentalities, those thought processes. And that's the only way we're going to change this world is that we start to think in different ways, educate ourselves, educate each other. I've had students who said they've talked to their parents and educated their parents and helped their parents see that the way that they were thinking was not right and that they had friends who were of different races and some of the stereotypes that their parents had of them had to be debunked in order to get them to understand and be more accepting. But it's gonna take all of us to do that, whether that is you having a conversation with someone where you're saying, hey, I know you're tell telling these jokes and you think it's funny, but it's not cool. You right. know, and trying to get people, because when you are just silent, so many people have been silent when jokes are said or when people say racist comment that they are agreeing with that person by being silent. So it's right. time that we stop being silent disagreeers and start disagreeing loudly and say, hey, that's not cool. That's not right. Please don't say that, at least not in my presence. And then when you stop laughing, you'll be surprised at how many people stop telling those jokes and stop behaving the way they do. Agreed. And it's very interesting because I have two of my four kids, uh, two of them are teenagers, a 15 and a 13 year old. And I sit at the dinner table and they will argue over social issues. They have, you know, my, my son has kind of, uh, he, I have to be careful with him because he's kind of definitely growing into very the macho mindset. But my daughter is definitely the like bleeding liberal heart. Like, you can't say this. You have to. You know, and I just I sit there at the table and I mean, they just go back and forth. But I say that to say I feel, I feel like in the generation coming up, they are learning sooner. There's so much more education. And that's why I think that multiculturalism is something we should really be pushing because um, because a lot of those old ideas that are born in that racist thread or even just in this stereotyping, we learn to self-hate very easily. You know, oh, if only I had the lighter hair or if I had lighter eyes or if I had the good hair or, you know what I'm saying? And, and like being a person, I'm like, I do, do my hair curly. Sometimes I do it straight, but I have really curly, <laughs> kinky hair. <laughs> and like, it's... It's, um, I was taught to Thank hate it as a kid. I was taught to hate it as a kid. <laughs> What'd you say? What'd you, you say? You might have some black in your family. You got them curls. <laughs> well, I honestly say this, and that's what I love about it. Like, and that's why I love you. Okay, so you stood in front of a room, and, I, and I'm to finish that thought, I love letting people understand. I am so many things, not one, and I flippin' love it. You yeah. know, you, none of us can look at one person anymore. If you were looking for that day where you could look at someone and guess who they are and what they represent and their entire history, dude, it's gone. Right? And it should be because what difference does it make? We're so conscious about trying to judge people based on their outer appearance. We don't even give them an opportunity to tell us who they are or prove to us who they are as an individual. And that's one of the things I'm trying to teach my kids, even at the young age of nine, seven, and four, that you need to treat people based on who they are as an individual, not because they're a boy, not because they're a girl, not because they're black or white or red or whatever. Right. It's because of who they are. And even as kids, they get it. They right. understand it. You know, society may try to, you know, knock that out of them, but I'll just keep driving it home to them, driving home the point just because one person does it doesn't mean that everybody that looks like them has that same belief system. Yeah, and I feel that society likes to push this idea that that's a liberal ideology, and I think it's just a humanity ideology. It's not, <laughs> you know, everything's trying to be politicized right now, and I'm very anti that because I'm like, okay, let's just take this a step back to human kindness, human relation, and how, like you said, if we all believe in the Adam and Eve concept, then you should not look at another person as, you sh it should be your brother or your sister, right? And like, not like, yeah, God, God <laughs> I mean, you know, in that sense. God even said, love thy neighbor. He didn't say, love thy neighbor only if they look like you. Right. <laughs> he said, right. love thy neighbor. Sure. Thanks. And I mean, so, okay, so you have been quoted, and I'm going to ask this because I kind of feel like, no disrespect to your great grandpops there, but I think if, when I do look at those men, though, I think they were great. I feel that they were operating with a very limited amount of knowledge about humanity for some reason. Obviously, they were passionate about making the birth of this nation and whatnot, but I don't know. I, I When we talk about the ideas of those days, like slavery, okay, let's just like say that. I mean, but you have been quoted as saying, um, so I feel like you could do a better job than him is what I went to, meant to say there, but you've been quoted, he could have done more. 
And one abolitionist once wrote that never before has a man received such fame for what he did not do because he wrote those words, all men are created equal, but yet he didn't practice them. And a lot of people gave him, you know, credit for those words. But it's up to us today to know to now use those words to ring true for every person in this country. So that definitely follows up with what I was just saying. I mean, yeah, do you feel like now, I mean, sorry, that should have had a question. <laughs> You're, you know, when you, hearing that and you look back, how do you feel in your mind he could have done more when you say that? Well, you know, some people say that, you know, he tried and he was a good slave owner. Is that such a thing, first of all? And he originally had in the Declaration of Independence that the slaves should be freed. But then since majority of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence did own slaves, of course, they threw that out. He could have done more. He could have freed his slaves. He could have paid his slaves. He could have said, OK, you guys don't want to do it in the Declaration. Well, I'm going to set the example and be the bigger person here and lead by example. He could have freed Sally Hemings. He could have done so many things that he did not do because he said one thing because it sounded good and looked good, but believed another thing because he never freed them and never did more for slavery. The abolitionists even asked him to join their fight to help them since he, quote unquote, believed all men were created equal, and he refused to. He didn't want to because he loved being able to live luxuriously and have free labor. Right. And that's the whole thing where people think uh, that, you know, uh, they know things were... Uh, they were living in slavery in those times. But people know what is right and wrong. You can't tell me that they didn't think that these people were worthy of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, or whatever, when they were the same people that were breastfeeding your children, right. raising your children, taking care of you and your family, and yet you somehow fashion that they're not human. Right. Right, which is what was done. Right I mean, absolutely. They were told, if they were literally told they were demons. They were, you know, the black community. And then you were, you were treated as a piece of property. Like, mm -hmm. that can't be in the good book, right? Well, that's why Jefferson wrote his own good book. So he was not seen as a sinner. He wrote his own Bible. Uh, and I'm sure he was a perfect gentleman in that Bible. <laughs> right. I know we always tell the story in the best light to ourselves. So yeah, on that, I mean, so I feel that, that, huh? I was just going to say on that point, and that's one of the reasons why I try to advocate for those who did not have voices, because a lot of these enslaved people, they did not have an opportunity to tell their story. We always hear from the victor's point. We always hear from his story. You right. know, it's not our story. It's not their story. And so it's time that we give them a voice. So to act like these things did not happen or to not uh, allow their voices to be heard now is, you know, negating the sacrifices that they put forth, the blood, sweat and tears that they put into the founding of this country. Because right. they've done so much to make sure Jefferson had time to write the Declaration of Independence, to make sure he had time to be the president, to make sure he had time to do all the things that people give him credit for. And he did amazing things. But we also have to recognize the fact that he owned over 600 people, that he was a slave owner. Let's not forget that. We can't just continue to act like he was a perfect person and we put him on this pedestal. No, he was a slave owner. Right, right. And I think that it's really noble of any of us to look at the people that we come from and understand that there was both good and negative. I mean, just as I told the story about my mother, I loved her. She's my, I'm her direct, you know, she's my mother for goodness sake. And I'm very candid about the things I was told on that side of my family. And, but it's not to paint them in a bad light. It's to show people that we should evolve from that mentality because it's not conducive to a healthy society. You know, it's really not. And, um, you know, l let me ask you, and, I, and I'm very thankful that you did do that. I think it's so important as as a descendant to speak your mind because, yeah, I feel like who else can talk about this than the person who knows that they, you know, is especially in um, in your case. Like, and so, and like you said earlier, like the black community, there's so many of them, they just don't know. It's like being an orphan for a, an entire, you know, you just don't know where you come from. And there's something there gives some side of some sense of who you are, even if it was a long time ago or, or three generations ago or whatever, or a thousand years ago. It gives you some comfort to some degree on knowing who you are. Um, 
how do you feel about the statues coming down? Sorry, um, the, you know, I mean, I know that that's a big topic of dis- discussion, yeah. and some people take it very personally when a statue, you know, like as if it's a living person. How? What are your thoughts? I think the Confederate statues should definitely come down. They were put up to celebrate people who were doing evil things to people and hurting people, and they were seen as signs of uh, belittling people, putting people in their places, saying we may have lost the war, but we're still over you, literally. We're still better than you, controlling you, and it's degrading to have them up and be celebrated for things that they did that were wrong. And for years, I've given Jefferson a pass to try to say, oh, you know, He's okay because he was the president and he did great things for this nation, so he should be allowed to stay. But he also, again, was a slave owner and a very conflicted man. And so I believe that if he, people in certain communities are offended by his public statues, that they should also be taken down and placed in historical museums, libraries, places where people can learn the true history of him and of other people whose statues are removed. I don't think they should remove them and burn them or throw them in the river. Right, right. They should be used as educational tools to tell people who these people are. And if you want to keep up his statue, then continue to educate people about him. Like Monticello, which is the, the home of Jefferson, they do an amazing job educating people about the full story of who this man was as a slave owner, as a founding father, as a person that fathered many children who were enslaved at the time. Right. So I think we do a good job giving us a complete picture and adding some context to the content and not just saying, here's a statue of a great man and nothing else. Right. But right. they tell us the full story. And I think they're doing it right. And a lot of other institutions need to follow in their example and leading the way and helping tell story, telling history the way it was, not rewriting history, mm-hmm. not sugarcoating or, or history, erasing it. history it's not even it about is. erasing it because that's what a lot of people think you're trying to do erase history we're not trying to erase history but we do want it to be accurate and properly it's given- already been erased that's the problem the same people are saying we're trying to erase history is like no you already erased history because you left out the fact that he owned 600 people exactly. that those were the people that gave their blood sweat and tears that make him who he is they forgot them. So they're the ones who actually erased history. And it's time we tell the full story and include all that. I mean, even 50 years ago, when you went to Monticello, you would have thought that he didn't even have slaves. And he built Monticello and ran it all by himself because they didn't want to see their icon tarnished. But then they have learned that it's better to tell the full story and to be true historians. And that's why they are telling the complete story now. And again, I think it's great. It makes him a, a, a more well-rounded person and it makes him more human. Right. Because that's what he, people forget that these people are human. Exactly. They put them on these pedestals. Nobody is perfect. We understand that. But he was also a human. And I think that's what a lot of people forget. Yeah, for sure. You know, so speaking, and you are a husband to your child, your your high school sweetheart, or college sweetheart, excuse me, Ch- Chandra, and you have three children. So you are a father and a husband, and I think we have a picture of you taking them to Monticello, right? Like, I think you, you took them. Um, Can you share? That's with- one of Jane Feldman's <laughs> favorite pictures, my co-author on the book, and she's a photojournalist in New York, and she loves this picture of us walking down Mulberry Row at Monticello, and you see some of the resurrected slave houses on the right where, you know, they worked and lived in many cases. And this is just like a magical shot because we're walking down these paths that our ancestors once roamed. And it's just, just the chills that you get being there and taking in the essence of just trying to think of what my ancestors would have thought when they were walking down this same dirt pathway. It's just an amazing experience to be there and have some type of um, this conceptualization of that place. I, I can only, I love it. It must've seemed quite surreal to be quite honest. I, and I, I, que- I, I honestly look at that picture though. And I, and I, and I also having like a complex history sometimes, I wonder how it's going to feel for you to really fully explain to your girls when they're older, of course, to explain how this all connects. But I think, uh, well, we've already started. that's the thing we've, uh, started, I have uh, Max yeah. McKenzie and my son Carter. We've already started it. They know what Monticello is. They know who Thomas Jefferson and Sally Amazing. Hemings are. And so we've already started to educate them and, and 
let them know who their ancestors were. Right. And because they are kids, we try to explain it in a sensitive, child-friendly way. Of course, of course, of <laughs> but course. But still, they know what slavery is, too. I mean, yeah. I can't act like these things didn't happen, but we also have to make sure that we don't repeat some of the things that have happened in our history. So that's why I think it's important to educate them about it. Yeah, sure. So, okay, so this is perfectly segueing into one of the... I, I read a piece that you wrote about your experience as a child going to class and sharing that you are a descendant of Jefferson. And so in your own words, because it really touched me, it touched me that experience. And, you know, I was like, I really got to hear him. I hear, our audience has to hear this. <laughs> well, I went to school in about second grade and I was proud to tell the class that Thomas Jefferson is my great, 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 uh, six finger, great grandfather. And the teacher said, sit down and stop telling lies. And the whole class laughed at me. But luckily, my mother came to school the next day and corrected the teacher and said, don't tell my son he's lying. He is a ninth generation descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And I think she really instilled in my brother, Sean, and I the belief that we must know who we are and be strong in that belief of who we are and not let other people define us for us because if you let them define you they will do it for the rest of your life so we really had to learn that lesson at an early age but i'm glad my mother was able to teach it to us and now i'm able to share it with my kids that is incredible and you know again speaking to the multiculturalism and knowing what it's like to be even in a family where i actually didn't fit in and i was often mistaken for someone else's kid mm. i it, like i said earlier when people look at me and assume they know who I am and my history. It's just, it, it's, I feel it's such, they do, it's such a disservice to the person doing it. Would you not agree? Because there's so much that we miss out on with other people, especially with regards to taking the time to get to know someone even. I mean, because right. race sometimes plays factors in whether people, how approachable they are with one another. Do you, do you agree? Totally. I totally agree. A lot of people miss out on opportunities to get to know each other because they all of a sudden want to just stereotype them based on the way they look. And you really could be missing out on a, a great friend, a great opportunity to learn something new about them, about yourself, about their culture. So it's unfortunate, but, you know, it happens all the time, but we can't continue to judge a book by its cover. <laughs> so that's one of the things I continue to, to tell my kids and try to and still in them. Even Dr. King was preaching that same thing when he was here. It's like, one day we have to get this right, people. Come on. And if you do a little research in your family, you may find out that you're not who you think you are. Just do a DNA test. I was even surprised at all the different things that was in my lineage. I put it up on my Facebook fan page at Mr. Shannon here. Yeah. And I did a live <laughs> DNA test. And, you know, I was amazed how many people were interested in seeing all these different things from European to Native American to uh, Congo and um, West Africa and Nigeria. All these things that are in my lineage. I was like, wow, yeah. okay, DNA. So you might be surprised at what you find if you start doing a little digging. Well, we should. I mean, technically, even my mother's side, I did a, I, one time, the one that I've done is a, the mitochondrial DNA, and it still eventually went all the way over to the Middle East. It was funny. I mean, like, in now, I mean, you know, we're talking about the ancient migration, but at the same book, everybody comes back from this particular place. And it is interesting, the journey along the way. Um, I, I want to ask you, in the spirit of leadership... You know, what is your hope for society in today's world? I know we've touched a little bit on it, but specifically, you know, I'd like to ask my guests, you know, I know you go out there and you advocate and you speak to students. So what when you are talking to society, what is it that you what is it that you want? What is it that you hope? We do better. <laughs> I would do two things. In the immediate future, I would hope everyone would rally around the Black Lives Matter movement to truly join forces to say Black lives do matter. I know all lives matter. We all know that. But right now, it's the Black lives that are being disproportionately harmed, killed, hurt by all of these, you know, not only, I won't even say police office, but the laws, the regulations, the prison system, all these things that are systemically and systematically wrong and flawed and negatively impacting the black community has to be stopped. And it can't just come from the black community. It's gonna take all of us 
in order to fight the system to equal it out more. And then once we do that, start including other people. And, you know, the Asian community, unfortunately, has been targeted and all this uh coronavirus mess and they're being discriminated against the the you know muslims who get on planes and different things like there's so many ways that we can grow out our equality in this country i think we definitely need to start with black lives first and then grow out to where we can truly live up to the passage that jefferson wrote that all men are created equal it may take some time It starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with people in our own families, whether it's our mother, our father, our brother, or our sister, whether it's our neighbor next door. We can make a difference and we can be, as that famous quote says, we can be the change we need to see in the world. I love that. And I want to ask, like, do you, so for me, okay, I am a non-black person. How do we, this is going to be a consistent, because a lot of my episodes for this entire season are shaped around supporting, as I've said, you know, to my production, Black Lives Matter, or just the education on racial disparity and the issues that are really plaguing all of us, you know, but more specifically, like you said, the, you know, Black Lives Matter. And the, so as an ally, you know, I know that part of what I want to do is amplify the other voices, and that's why I invite them to come on and have these conversations with me. What am I, what could I be doing if I'm an anti-racist? I do love that term. I don't really like labels a lot, but I will say I'll take the anti-racist one for sure. If you, you know, um, as an anti-racist in support of BLM, what are some of the things specifically that people can do in our, in our local community, just starting locally? Well, first of all, have you ever seen the the play Avenue Q? I heard of the play Avenue Q with the puppets. There's this song that says, everyone's just a little bit racist. <laughs> it's a great song to uh, really hit home in an uh, innocent way of how we right. all have a little bit in us, but we can't overcome it. We can target and say, now that I recognize it, I can work to not do that, to not have those uh, mechanisms that go off in my head when I see a certain type of person and automatically think a stereotype about that person. But I think that's one thing we can do. Another thing is we can start to educate ourselves on different cultures, on different people, so we don't have those moments of ignorance where we think that someone is a certain way and we start assuming things about people. And we can also start doing more functional things like voting, voting for people who are willing to put policies in office and policies in place that protect all people and not just a certain group of people. Right. Uh, more equal opportunity um, laws and things that we can vote for. I mean, voting is so important. Even the Supreme Court justices that we're putting in place, there are a lot of people that you know don't like some of the things that these people stand for or believe, and we need to pay attention to those. Even right. those small local uh, races that people don't think are important are very important. Right. So, I think that is a, a big part we can do. And just being humane, simple stuff, random acts of kindness towards someone. Hey, try not crossing the street when you see someone different from you approaching. Try not to grab your purse because you think someone looks threatening. Now, sometimes people can look threatening. I'm just saying. But that doesn't mean that every person is because that hurts. That like digs into someone's soul like, okay, now this uh, person is afraid of me just because I'm a black man. Here we go again. Right. It's like, I'm not. I am like far from that. But, you know, it digs at people's soul and it makes them feel uncomfortable, you know, when they do that. So I think it has to come to a point where you just do even small things like that. To just treat people as humans. Treat yeah. people as you would want to be treated. The golden rule, people. Golden rule. Golden That's rule. Simple. It's so much easier than people really make it out to be. And on that, you know, it's funny when you say we are a little bit racist. Everyone's a little bit. I actually talk about how racism is not exclusive to white people. Being also, you know, in the Middle Eastern culture and I have Latino friends, I call them out all the time. I'm like, come on, you know, like, let's just all have a real candid conversation about what our families have had, try, really tried to push this perspective, which I don't get because if you go to Egypt or you go to places and you see structures that were built thousands of years ago with technology and archaeology comprehension that we can't even figure out today, <laughs> it's you kind of just, you know, all that stuff goes to hell in a handbasket with that thought but you know when you talk again going to the education of it right Tupac once said 
even black people in certain neighborhoods, they they lock their doors just like a white person will. And I don't mean to use white and like I just let's just say non-white person or non-black person, excuse me, because I don't want anyone to get offended by that. But, um, you know, you get a lot of people from like your middle class that see a black man, even black people will look at a black person and he's got the slouchy pants and he's got the he's got the. Is there a part of black history that people don't understand if they're not black where even if you don't agree with someone, how their style is, when we look at the black culture, a lot of it stems from wanting to be different than white people. Like, they'll say, why can't they be like us, right? Like, that's what the mentality is. Why can't they be like us? But I feel like with the black history, there is there is a desire for some people. Some of it's socioeconomically background, but I'm saying this to genuinely def- to ha- maybe present or ask about a different perspective because to me, it does seem that I mean, I've spoken to some, you know, people who are black and it's like, look, we want to be different. We, we walk this way. We talk this way because we want to be different. What, what do you think about that conversation? I mean, I definitely think culturally there are certain things that people do that they want to be different. Some of them, they don't necessarily see it as different. They just see it as cool. They just see it as, hey, I'm going to wear my hair this certain way because I like it. Right. I'm going to wear this bandana on my head because it's cool. I'm going to wear... My pants down, which is not cool. Please, I'm, my kids but never let me see them do that. But they may think that that's cool. So I, sometimes it's just a different of, difference of culture. Some people that, you know. But it's not necessarily Jews negative and, nor violent. That's what I'm trying to say is sometimes right, people perceive right. that just, difference as a threat. Mm-hmm. You know just because I mean? they don't understand it and it's different from what they're used to. And so they see it as, oh. And, you know, the society hasn't helped in perpetuating some of these images, whether it's on the news or in the movies, when you say, oh, you know, the thugs always have the pants down in the movie before they rob you, or the Hispanic always has a bandana around his head with a bunch of tattoos before they get involved in some, you know, miscellaneous activity. Yeah. Society has helped perpetuate a lot of these stereotypes. Right. But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean you have to believe it. Even when I went to college and have met people who had never talk to a black person before the only knowledge that they had of black people is what they've seen on the movies or when they stumbled upon BET. And so (laughs) it's like, that's part of the education. That's part of just knowing someone with an individuality or an expression of oneself. You know, one person could say, you know, even Lady Gaga, she's expressing herself. She's different. That doesn't mean she's dangerous or crazy. It just means that she's expressing herself. And, you know, same thing with a Nicki Minaj or, you know, any of the other artists. You know, some people, even if they don't have platforms, want to be creative and artists so they express themselves. Yeah. And going back to the point that we had is just sometimes if you take the time to get to know someone, even if they seem different, I bet you you could sit down and have a really good conversation. You know, I mean, and I just think people miss out. I feel like what you did with Descendants was very empowering for yourself, was it? I mean, it was because with the Smithsonian's Descendants Project, I really wanted to hold a mirror to America to show them what has happened because of slavery, that Thomas Jefferson, a white man, could have a descendant that is now a black man nine generations later. And I wanted to hold that mirror to say, this is real, this happened. And I wanted to give a voice to those people and all those people who maybe did not believe the story at some point, like, yes, I'm here because of that relationship, regardless of what you think that relationship consisted of, I'm a product of that. And I'm real, I'm alive, I'm a person. And you have to recognize that and recognize the people who came before me. I love that because, yes, even if they don't like it, it doesn't change the facts. I think you wrote that somewhere. Whether you agree with it or not, it does not change who I am. And I love that. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. But let's get it right now. Please tell the audience audio. You can spell out your handle for the audio audience to see how we can stay connected to you and support you. Yeah, please stay connected with me on all social media platforms at Mr. Shannon Lanier. That's M-R-S-H-A-N-N-O-N. My last name is L-A-N-I-E-R. And also my newest platform, Daddy Duty 365. It's a podcast where I speak to celebrity fathers about the good, the bad, and the funny of fatherhood. 
you'll laugh, you'll cry, and you'll definitely have a good time. Well, I love that. I love that a lot. It's incredibly uh, special to have you come and support Unsugarcoated Media and what we do for the community and especially this podcast. I um, will follow up and we, you know, just thank you for your time. I really I can't wait to, we'll have to have you on again, you know. Yeah, I'm ready. I can talk about more than Jefferson stuff too. I, I I'm know. a journalist. So. <laughs> I know. <laughs> thank you for appeasing us with this. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We cannot wait to come back again next week. We'll keep it going. In the meantime, um, do good. Be out there. Stay connected with me for the audio at Alia, A-A-L-I-A underscore unsugarcoated, all one word on Instagram. And thanks for your messages, your comments, your support. We love you. We appreciate you. We will see you next week. Bye.